In this video, I'll run you through the 12 apps I use every day when using my iPad Pro as my primary work machine. Let's go. Welcome everybody to TechCraft, this is Rob, and today I'll be talking about the apps I use on my iPad Pro to get my work done. This video is the second part of a two-part series on using the iPad Pro as your daily driver work machine. If you haven't seen part one, where I talk about the hardware and the accessories I'm using, then I'll link that up here. Now, of course, I can't talk about every app I have on my iPad. I think I've got close on 100 apps installed now, but many of those are for hobbies or for entertainment. So I'll be talking about just the 12 apps I use every day to get my work done. My work involves a lot of software engineering, and I won't be covering the specific apps I use for that. If you are interested in hearing a lot more about how I do software work on the iPad Pro, then throw a comment down below and I'll be sure to put together a video on that topic. Before we dive in, I just wanna take a few seconds to thank everybody who's subscribed and supported the channel so far. Just after the first video in this series, we broke the 100 subscriber mark, and in the process of scripting this video, we've actually gone over 200 subscribers as well. Obviously, small milestones in the grand scheme of YouTube, but for me, huge milestones. Uh, and I, I, I want to thank you all for that. It's great to be able to produce content that I'm passionate about and know that there are other people out there who are also passionate about similar topics. So let's start with an app that I know I use more often than I'd like, and I'm sure many of you will feel the same, and that is email. There are loads of great choices for email on iOS. You've of course got the built-in Apple Mail, which is a great app and seems to get better nearly every iOS release. Microsoft have released Outlook for, the, for iOS, for iPhone and iPad, which is actually surprisingly good. And if you use Exchange or Office 365 for work, then it's definitely worth giving that a go. If you're in a Gmail or a G apps world, then the Gmail app is pretty good, although I found the ads to be quite frustrating. After trying all of these apps, I've actually settled on using Spark from the Riedel team. Uh, Riedel makes some fantastic apps for iPad and iOS, and Spark has really hit that sweet spot for me for a productive, sleek email app. My choice of Spark really reflects why I chose to focus on the iPad Pro as my primary work device. I want app experiences that are focused on a task that allow me to um, get that task done as quickly and as efficiently as possible and minimize the distractions I'm seeing while I'm working on that task. Spark also reflects the particular characteristics that I'm looking for when I'm choosing an application for daily use. I work with the keyboard attached to the iPad pretty much 80, maybe 85% of the time, and Spark has a huge set of keyboard shortcuts that I can use to drive the interface so I don't have to constantly use my mouse or, or touch the screen. But when you do drop down to touch, it has a very natural set of gestures. And when I'm using touch on apps, I always want something where the touch feels like it's the fastest way to do it. And it's not just like, oh, well, I have to use touch because it's the iPad. So I really like the way Spark has worked here. And these are general principles I apply when I'm looking for apps to use every day. The killer feature of Spark, though, is its smart inbox. When you receive emails, they are automatically segmented into a personal, a newsletter, a notifications, and a scene group. And as you process emails in the first three groups, and you read them, they go into the scene group. And then you can either operate on these emails individually using swipe gestures, or you can operate on the group as a whole also using swipe gestures. The swipe gestures are fully customizable, so I have right swipe configured to be archive and left swipe configured to be snooze, but you can configure that however you want and whatever best fits your workflow. Spark is also available on iPhone and I have my iPad and my iPhone set up exactly the same way. So I'm always working in an interface that is familiar when I'm doing my email. Calendaring is another area where on the iPad you've got a huge selection. Spark actually has a built-in calendar, which is quite nice for basic appointment planning in your email workflow. Of course, there's Apple Calendar, which is a pretty good app, and I do still drop down to it on my iPhone occasionally just for agenda browsing. But over the last year, I've become completely addicted to using Fantastical for all things related to planning and scheduling. As you know, I really like keyboard-driven interfaces, and Fantastical has one of the best that I've seen. So obviously I can open up Fantastical using the keyboard, using the standard spotlight shortcuts. Once I'm in Fantastical, I can press Command and N to create a new event. And it's here though that the, the interface really starts to excel. I can just start typing in event details quite 
naturally into this little event entry box and it's detecting what I really mean by those. So here we've got an appointment with my buddy JT to go for tacos on Tuesday at noon and it detects what that means. I can even say that the event lasts for two hours and it knows it's going to run from noon until 2 p.m. This is really impressive. I can even go back and change the time zone to EST. So maybe it's not happening here in the UK. It's going to happen somewhere on the East Coast of the US. And it shifts appropriately in my calendar. This is just, I'm so in love with this, this interface. I also have this complete full screen view of my calendar. And then if I want to drop down to touch, it's very natural just to move these events around. So maybe actually this event does happen at uh at noon in London rather than noon in New York. If I swipe up from the bottom, I get this full month view here in the lower right and I get my agenda on the lower left. This is kind of like my default view for just thinking about my diary and moving things around and it's, it's quite nice. But if I want to see a fuller view of my agenda, I can swipe up again and the top bit compresses into like a timeline view and now I've got my agenda on the side. This is really a great calendar app. And if you spend a lot of time in meetings and you're planning a lot of meetings, I can highly recommend it. If you go to very few meetings and you have very few events, then Apple Calendar is probably gonna be sufficient for you. Fantastical has support for reminders and tasks as well as standard calendar events, but I prefer to use a dedicated task list app that is more suited to that particular purpose. Now, let me caveat all of the following by saying I am not in any way a task management expert. I watch all these great videos on YouTube of people who've got the getting things done workflow down to a fine art and I'm super jealous of how organized they are. But I do use a task list pretty much every day. I just don't use it exhaustively like people on the internet seem to do. Because of this, I have a fairly simple set of requirements for a task list. Obviously, I want the tasks to be appearing on my iPad, on my iPhone, and on my Mac. I want to be able to group tasks together into projects or kind of categories. I want to have a way to set reminders on those tasks. And ideally, I want a place to capture tasks that don't really have a defined schedule, but maybe I'll get around to at some point in the future. For me, Things is the app that meets all these requirements and fits with my mental model of how a task list should work. I've actually paid for the app on my iPad, I, on my iPhone, and on my Mac. Mac. Um, these are not cheap apps, but I do really appreciate the fact that it's a one-time purchase and I'm not having to pay a monthly subscription. Included with the purchase price, you actually get free access to the Things Cloud, so all the tasks sync. Now, I would have preferred that the syncing happened through like Dropbox or Google Drive or something, but it's a small price to pay for what is a great service for me. If you're a hardcore task management geek or you're really into like the getting things done workflow, then maybe you'll find that things isn't for you. I know that when I was trying to do GTD a lot, one of the things I used was location-based reminders. So I'd set a reminder for when I got to the office to do something and things doesn't support that. So you may need a different task list, but if all you're doing like me is the kind of basic task management and you're not necessarily trying to manage your entire life, things is a really low friction interface and I think is quite a beautiful app to actually use every day. Email, calendaring, and task list really cover off the apps I use to kind of organize myself and organize my workflow. Let's now take a look at the apps I use to actually get my work done, and we'll start with writing, note-taking, and document markup. So for writing, although I do use a traditional word processor when required, I much prefer to use a lightweight text editor with something like Markdown to get my work done a lot faster. Now, if you're not familiar with Markdown, it's definitely worth looking into and I'll throw a link to a great tutorial in the description below. For me, the iPad Pro is almost the perfect environment for writing on and it was one of the main reasons I chose to use the iPad Pro as my primary work environment. I do a lot of writing, so having a device that works for my primary task is very, very important. I like the fact that it's super distraction free. I like the fact that I have a single pane of, of glass onto what I'm doing. And I just like the small form factor and the instant on, which means I can just write whenever the inspiration takes me or if I've got 10 minutes sitting waiting for a train, I can just get my iPad out and do some writing. Because the iPad is such a good option for writing, there's a great selection of apps out there. And over the years, I've used Bear, I've used Ulysses, and I've used IA Writer, all of which are fantastic apps for writing on the iPad. In the last year though, I seem to have settled on using Bear, which for me, just kind of aesthetically and the way the keyboard shortcuts work, has just proven to be the ideal environment for writing on. When I'm writing scripts for this channel, I will write them in Bear, and often I'll have one window in Bear open with the script and another window open in Bear that has kind of like the shot list for the extra shots I want to take. Then when I'm doing the filming like I am now, I'll usually read the script from the iPhone. Obviously I'm not reading the script directly, but at least I know what I want to say. 
I've even gone so far with Bear now to actually pay for the Bear Pro subscription so I can get extra security and syncing features. I think it's only $15 a year, but for me, it was really worth it. Whilst I do take some text notes in Bear, I obviously prefer to use the Apple Pencil with a dedicated note-taking app. I've used three different apps for note-taking over the last two years, uh, Good Notes, Notability, and Note Shelf. Now, my handwriting and my drawing skills are pretty poor, so for me, these apps are kind of like functionally equivalent from a note-taking perspective. If you've got great handwriting and you're great at drawing, then maybe you'll find one of these is better than the other. I can't really comment on that. So ultimately, it comes down to which of these apps fits into my workflow the best. GoodNotes gets loads of love in the community. It's a great app, but it only supports iCloud Sync, and I just stay clear of iCloud completely, and you'll see why shortly. So then choosing between Notability and NoteShelf, it just came down to which app I felt had the nicer UI, basically. Uh, NoteShelf is really sleek. I love the way that it organizes the different notes into notebooks, and these notebooks can have custom covers on them, which looks cool, but also if you choose distinctive covers, it makes it really easy to pick the right notebook at a glance. So in the end, I've stuck with NoteShelf. For marking up documents like PDFs or web pages, the inbuilt iPad OS markup features are actually quite nice. I'll often use this for quick turnaround, maybe signing a document up and sending an email, or just providing one or two comments to a document. However, for more detailed comment workflows, I actually use two apps depending on which kind of document I'm working on. For most common PDFs, and especially for kind of captures of web pages and, ca and PDFs of Word documents, I'm using PDF Expert from Riaddle. The annotation options are really, really nice. So you can specifically highlight and annotate text, or you can do freehand highlighting and annotation. I also really like PDF Expert just as a general PDF manager. So I actually have a folder on my iPad that has all the man manuals for my cameras and microphone and all that kind of stuff. Just if I'm out shooting and I forget how something works, I have it there to hand. The only PDFs that I don't store and annotate within PDF Expert our academic papers. For this, I use an app called Mendeley. Now, Mendeley is quite an idiosyncratic app. The experience is nowhere near as nice as PDF Expert for general editing and annotation. However, it does understand the metadata of academic papers. So things like search and discovering similar papers is really quite nice inside Mendeley. It has its own inbuilt sync and storage. So I also have Mendeley on my Mac as well for reading papers if I'm doing some coding there. Um, Ultimately, though, I have like 10 years of papers stored in Mendeley, so it's really hard for me to move. I think if I hadn't done that, I would certainly still give PDF Expert a go as being my one only PDF manager. So let's talk about cloud storage. Obviously, iPadOS supports iCloud, but it also supports pretty much every other cloud storage system in existence. So Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, the list goes on. They're all supported. For nearly everything, I use Dropbox and I stay clear as much as possible from iCloud. Part of this is historic. I've been using Dropbox since I think 2009. So I've got nearly 10 years of, <laughs> of content in there. Uh, part of it also is just my belief that Dropbox is a superior service, especially from a security aspect. I really worry about iCloud and in general, and I think Apple's cloud services have never really been super reliable and super secure. Dropbox gives me all the space I need, and it gives me all the security features that I need for my workflow. Of course, you don't have to choose just one cloud provider. I'm actually using pretty much everyone. At work, we use Office 365, so I'm using Microsoft OneDrive. At my previous job, we were using the Google Suite, so I was using Google Drive, and I still have some historical files in there. And then for some particular parts of my work, we also use Box, so I, I have all of these installed on the iPad. I think ultimately you're going to choose your cloud storage vendor for your own personal needs, and then probably choose another one for your work needs, and that choice might be made for you when you go to your job. Because you need to support multiple storage options on your iPad, this brings us on to the topic of file management. So it's taken me some time to get used to it, but more and more now, I'm just using the standard iPadOS files app for my file management. All my cloud storage options are plugged into files. I can access my local network drives here at home, and when I'm on the go, I can access all my pluggable storage, like external drives and so forth. Prior to using files, I was using documents from Riaddle, another great app from that team. Um, this is still a great app, but 
I like the fact that Files is the built-in app and I'm trying to reduce the number of third-party apps I have on my iPad. That said, I still do find myself kind of like instinctively, I guess, just dropping into documents uh, certain days, but I think that will change over time and I'll probably uninstall documents in the next week or so. So we saw earlier that I really like to use Bear for writing. Uh, despite that preference, I haven't managed to eradicate using a traditional word processor and traditional Office suite from my workflow. Now, it's basically impossible to make a concrete recommendation here because there are three great choices. You can use the Apple suite, the Google suite, or Microsoft Office suite. And which choice you make will largely, I imagine, be governed by the kind of work you do. So I use Office at work because we have Office 365. For my personal work, I really like using Keynote for building presentations. And I do quite like using Google Sheets over Numbers because it just works better for me. All of these things work really, really well. I have found that Word, Pages, and Google Docs for my requirements all work very well. The same with Google Slides, Keynote, and uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. Where I think the real difference comes in is with spreadsheets. Now, Excel on the iPad is definitely superior to Numbers and to Google Sheets. That I can't dispute that. But it isn't quite Excel on Windows. So if you are the kind of person whose job involves doing a lot of financial modeling or complex spreadsheet modeling, you might find that Excel on the iPad isn't sufficient. And I've often found even that Excel on the Mac isn't sufficient. And I still keep a copy of Excel on Windows for that reason. That said though, all the choices are great. And if you need an office suite, you can pretty much pick any of them and they'll do the job. I work remotely a lot, so I really need a good video conferencing system and a good chat system to really get my work done. Which app you use, much like an office suite, is largely going to be a function of where you work. But if you are coming to this new or you're looking to choose an app for your organization, I can maybe make a few recommendations. On the video conferencing side, I think it's really easy. Just use Zoom. This is the only app that I think I can unambiguously recommend over all the others. I've tried every video conferencing system in existence over the last 10 years, and Zoom has been the only one that doesn't leave me tearing out what little hair I have left. I'd even go so far as to say I actually like using Zoom. It actually encourages me to book a video conference. So if you're looking for a video conferencing system, I can wholeheartedly recommend Zoom. I'm definitely not sponsored by them, but it's just a really good system. On the chat side, I can't make such a glowing recommendation. There are a bunch of options. There's Slack, there's Google Hangouts, all those kind of things. We use Slack at work and I've used Slack in a previous job and I'd probably use Slack again. I know it, it works well. It scales well with a big team. It works well when you're remote, which for me is a, is a big plus. It has a very frustrating notification system. You can't disable the notifications for any longer than 24 hours, which means you have to go into settings to disable notifications for the whole app if you go on vacation or something, which is really kind of annoying. But it works, but I'm not getting excited about it. So these are the apps I use pretty much every day to do the bulk of my kind of non-coding work. Obviously, I do use other apps. I have a suite of apps for my photo editing. I have a suite of apps that I use for video work. And I obviously have a suite of apps for coding. If you're interested in hearing about those apps, then throw a comment below and I'll happily put together a video on that. I'd also love to hear from you about the apps that you're using. If you've got any like tips for apps that you think I'm missing out on, or you've got an app that you think is killer for your workflow, chuck a comment below and I'd love to hear about that. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been useful. I will be posting many more tips, tricks, reviews, and detailed tutorials. So please do hit like, do hit subscribe, and don't just hit subscribe, but hit the bell so you don't miss out on future content. Other than that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.